Uh, before we talk about the get into the meat of it, why should you listen to me? Uh, I work with a company called Phase Two. We are a digital engagement and customer engagement company based here, based in Virginia, with offices and outposts around the country, uh, with a mission to inspire, engage, and inform. Me personally, I've been kicking around DC technology for the better part of 20 years and have worked with uh, nonprofits like the Brookings Institution, Aspen. I have worked with several of the institutes here at NIH and then many uh, corporate organizations as well. All that to say that I've kind of seen, if not all, I've seen a lot of it in my, uh, in my time. A lot of us, some of you have probably written or responded to RFPs and asked for SEO services. They go like these 25 hours of SEO services a month, and that's nice. And what that usually means is hiring a consultant, a separate SEO consultant, to monitor Google really closely, keep track of the changes, and then try to do a mixture of, of magic, alchemy, to try and change your pages with keywords and and basically just for individual pages, follow Google, all their twists and turns. Um, and it's a really a keyword-based focused way to do that. Uh, for a lot of agents, for a lot of organizations, that works. But we think that there is a different way, uh, a way that, that is more applicable to government agencies, and I want to talk about that today. Uh, I, we think that that sort of following Google waiting for everything to, everything to happen is just not for a lot of companies, a lot, a lot of agencies, a lot of organizations, the best way to do it. And I want to talk about why that's true. And part of it is for, because of how Google releases their updates. Google tweaks the algorithm 500 to 600 times a year. That's two times a day just for the US English index. At the same time, they rarely announce those changes in advance. So the organization, so people who watch SEO and watch Google really closely, it's always a fire drill. What's happening? Did something change? Something change for your pages? Something change for my pages? Are we, do we understand? And they rarely describe the impact of the changes or how we as a community can address those. A great example is something that happened just August 1st. A, a new update, a blog, it's called a core update, came out. It's called uh, Google Medic, and this is how they released it. This week we, updated, we released a broad core algorithm update as we do several times per year. Our guidance about such updates remains the same as in March, as we covered here. So what did they say in March? There's no fix for pages that may perform less well than others than to remain focused on building great content. Over time, it may be that your content may rise relative to other pages. So, we did a whole bunch of stuff. Won't tell you what. But don't worry about it, everything's gonna be okay. Uh, that's no way to run a revolution, frankly. So, what do we think at phase two instead? There's a different way to do this. Uh, we believe that search engine optimization isn't a separate activity from website management, but is the result of building the right digital experience for your audiences. And what does that really mean? Uh, Google, they want to send users to information that they think is valuable, that they think represents expertise, that has authority, that is trustworthy. Uh, at the same time, we think that if you keep doing the right things for your users, for your audiences, day in and day out, you really understand their needs, you really respond to them, and you know, keep track of the big changes, like the move to a mobile-first index, uh, which happened just in March. We think if you just do the right things for your users, day in and day out, that Google will come to you. Uh, what are the right things? We think that it requires a focus on content, community, and code, which I'll get into today. But luckily, everything I'm going to talk about today is part of the key mission. 
the live uh, marketing directors, live directors of communication are charged with as part of serving the public. So again, the focus is on content, community, and code. So I'll start with content. The big goal, of course, <laughs> the core of content strategy is understanding audiences' goals, creating content and experience that encourage them to achieve those goals. That's content strategy in a nutshell, content strategy 101. In short, understand their goals and, and do what you can to help them achieve those goals. And of course, this means focusing on your audiences, the people you're trying to serve, what they're trying to accomplish, rather than your organization, how it's arranged, and what your organization is trying to accomplish. In many cases, those are going to overlap, but a strong focus is part of a content strategy on serving audiences. In practice, these are the things that are all part of digital strategy, in the federal digital strategy, writing in plain language. What does that mean? Write for your audience first and foremost. Understand who they are, understand what they need, understand their emotional state when they're coming to speak with you. I think especially at NIH, we forget that folks who are coming to get the information, they're going to be scared. They're probably going to be a little anxious about having to Google that condition that they might think they have and they really need trust and information. So understanding their audience understand what they're going through, and doing that with empathy. Writing in plain language, of course, means using concise and scannable text, uh, highlighting keywords like hyperlinks and typeface variations, etc. Using meaningful subheadings. We find people get tripped up on this a lot. Get into your own head. You have your style guide, and you want to write clever subheads that you think is going to uh, move people along. But really, give them something meaningful. Give them something to understand. Bulleted lists, writing a one diff for, for a paragraph. This is all really going back to that old school journalistic inverted pyramid style. And uh, of course, we think that using about half the word count uh, of conventional writing, especially for a lot of government folks, uh, we end up writing long guidelines and policies, and everything has to be 10,000 words. Sometimes you've got to find that thing that's, a, that's 500, that's scannable, that just like, gets to the heart of the matter. That's serving your audience. That's serving your mission. At the same time, keep it conversational. We're at a point right now where places like Alexa, Google Assistant, etc., 70% of voice searches from Google Assistant use a conversational style. We've long gone past the time where people are just typing in their keywords into the box. They're going to ask a full question. Uh, so write in those full questions. And what, that, what that means for us as content creators is that things like page titles, section headers, frequently asked questions, question and answer, those things, those things are directly translated into how voice, voice search and voice assistance work. Uh, in fact, Pending right now is a new part of Google, a new part of what's called schema, which I'll talk, talk about in a second, that explicitly uses FAQs as drivers for voice search. So that's going to be picked up uh, by Google Assistant, by Alexa, by Siri, by all those folks. Make it multilingual. I think every organization has a language access plan. Create content that supports the languages that you've outlined. A lot of folks are going to be coming to your sites with limited English proficiency, and we are at a place right now um, where just simply following that plan, executing it, is part of the public mission, part of a civic service, and does great, frankly, does great for SEO as well. Google has separate indexes for different languages and for, diff and for different countries. Uh, so being able to ha show an English piece of content, Spanish piece of content, Portuguese, uh, Korean, Vietnamese, etc., uh, that's going to do great for your SEO, but more importantly, truly part of the public mission, the language access plan. And finally, for the designers and the UX folks in the room, 
using clean interaction design. Uh, at this point, the Google Crawlbot doesn't just scan the text of your pages anymore. You can actually see, see the text, see the page, and interact with it. So using a really well-tested information architecture, and well-tested is important, uh, it's often, we often get caught up in creating a uh, primary map that just follows the organizational structure or is created at the whim of what we call the hippo, the highest paid person's opinion. <laughs> the, okay. Well, I think it should say about us. Or, uh, or Lauren, there's, we are at a place now where it is really easy via card sort, via tools like optimal sort, to test information architectures before they get distributed out to the literally millions of people who will look at your site in a month. Take an hour Create an IA test and send it out to your audience. Send it out to your office even. 50 people looking at it is better than one person looking at it. You, you will be surprised by what you find, I guarantee you. Part of the interaction design is engaging landing pages. You want to make sure that with the wealth of information that folks have at their fingertips, we have landing pages that establish brands so they know that where they are, the site they wanted to come to, uh, that really give a, a good understanding of what resources are available and encourage them to explore with clean content aggregation pages. So this is your best of, your latest, uh, your most popular uh, lists. All of this is done to encourage content exploration and in some cases conversion. So uh, conversion is a salesy word that we usually reserve for commercial uh, clients but for the IRS for example conversion might be downloading a form. Conversion might be signing up for a newsletter. So make sure that, that as part of the design we're thinking about me, we're thinking about exploration and conversion all at once. This is just, again, folks are coming, they want information. As, uh, as owners of .gov sites, you have access to the information and you have built-in trust just by being part of the .gov domain. So use that and honor that uh, by really serving your audiences. Part of serving audiences is understanding the community. So for us, community is all about uh, linking in and linking out. The web, we call it the web for a reason. It's a web of conversations that are happening in a community. It's a web of conversations that are happening in a community. Uh, so in this section, I'll quickly talk about ways to make sure that you are taking part in that conversation. It's happening anyway, whether you're taking part of it or not. So take part. Really simply, just by maintaining your links, scan your site monthly to detect your bad URLs, and including expired off-site links. Often we only think about the things that are under our domain, where if you're linking off to a page that doesn't exist anymore, uh, that's, that's no good. It's no good for SEO, and it's no good as a public service. Reducing those errors by eliminating those links. Reducing duplicate content pages by redirecting from old URLs to the current page or from an expired page or an archived page uh, to the new current page. Review incoming links for quality. You can use uh, tools like Moz, like Ahrefs, uh, like Screaming Frog, great tool, terrible name, uh, to review um, incoming links for quality. And if they're poor quality links, you can disavow those. So that Google does not count those against you because uh, Google's looking at the ecosystem. Not only who you link to, but who links to you. If you're part of what they call a bad neighborhood, uh, that's going to lower your SEO. And of course, you always got to keep it social. This means writing page titles and page excerpts that encourage click-through from Google. Uh, we, this is an often forgotten part of SEO, an often forgotten part of content creation, is that the most beautiful page, the page that's most trustworthy, has the best information, 
doesn't matter if when people find it in Google, even if it's the number one slot, if they don't trust that title and want to click through back to your site, if they don't understand the, what the excerpt means or if it's not, it doesn't engage them in a way that encourages them to click back through to your site, um, you're not serving them well. And Google uses those rates as part of its SEO ranking factors, as part of its calculations. So if, if they place a search engine result the very top, you know, first page, first result, and no one clicks through it over time, that's going to fall on the rankings. Because they're, what they're seeing is, we put it here, but no one's clicking through. Maybe we got it wrong. And so they're going to slowly move that down the rankings. At the same time, create off-site links when appropriate. I know this can be a touchy subject. Uh, because there are a lot of agencies that are kind of wary of linking off-site even to their partners or even to other .govs. But like I said, this is a web of conversation. And that conversation is happening whether you take part in it or not. So at least by linking out, you're able to influence the conversation. As part of that, collaborate with your government and nonprofit partners. This is probably, it goes, <laughs> goes wider than just SEO or, or content strategy and goes into deeper editorial strategy, but you know, you, that, as part of your editorial calendar, there are a lot of times when you know what you're going to be publishing three or four months in advance. At least in, in some cases, work with your nonprofit partners to amplify your message, encourage them to link back into you. And I've got to just say, you know, the, the HHS <laughs> digital storefront, I think, is one of the most criminally underused items inside HHS. It's, just re it's a great and easy way to syndicate out your content, uh, basically for free. All the things that you need to do, to the few things you need to do to prepare your content for inclusion in the storefront, things like tagging it with taxonomy and categories, creating an excerpt for it, creating a good title for it, things you should be doing as part of the larger digital strategy. And include social media in your outreach plan. I think we're almost at a place, I won't say post-social media, uh, but in some cases I'm still, we're still seeing places where outreach plans, content strategies, engagement strategies don't include social it's still important. Folks are still having conversations out there. You need to be part of that conversation. Uh, and just having your site, having individual pages represented, does great to raise that SEO. Finally, uh, for the programmers in the audience, I do want to talk a little bit about code. We've talked about content. We've talked about community and making sure you're taking part in that community. So just a little bit about code. The big idea is to be optimizing for safety and for speed. Following the federal mandate of SSL everywhere, I think that is now a year and a half old, give or take. Uh, so at this point, everyone should be SSL end to end. It's a trust factor for Google. They are now ranking uh, sites higher that are SSL end to end. But also it's just a trust factor for your audiences. I think we all are we have all aware of and have all seen so many places and, and times where information gets hacked and who knows where your, where your social security number is being spread around at this point. Uh, so following that SSL everywhere mandate is really important. Avoiding landing page redirects. So when someone does click through from Google to the, to the page, don't automatically redirect them to a different page. That's, uh, it's, it's uh, not a good coding practice. It's not good for their experience. You're trying to build and maintain that trust to build and maintain authority and redirecting them away from someplace they didn't want to go is a good way to lose the, that authority and lose that trust. Uh, a little bit geeky, but uh, enable compression on pages. So if you are sending lots of information down to a browser or down to a mobile phone, using browser caching, minifying the code, optimizing images, making sure you're seeing the right size images, image to the right device, prioritizing the content that is visible on the page so you don't have to send everything all at once if you have a really long scrolling page. There are techniques that let you deliver it in chunks. 
prioritize how you write the code so that that visible content gets delivered first. And do everything, basically just do everything you can do to reduce the server response time. Uh, it's, this is sort of a little bit deep in the weeds, uh, but as part of that, using a content distribution network. We often forget, because we are you know, sitting in offices with always on, super fast connections, basically an endless pipe, that a lot of the folks who visit our sites do so on mobile. So I think I've now, we've now reached a point where within HHS at least, more than 50% of all traffic is via mobile. That's important to remember, not only because it changes your device size, but those folks are gonna be on limited data plans in many cases. Uh, and so just take doing things like this to make sure that the pages you're delivering to them are as small as possible. It makes it easier for them. That's a, that is one of those small things that is a true public service and demonstrates true empathy. You know, it's, uh, it's really easy to say, oh, we want to do everything with video. It's going to be super cool. We've got like a 10 page scrolling infographic animation visualization. And there's this poor person on their phone, and it's the 29th day of the month, and they really need to just see if they have that disease and condition. They really need that to understand that they're going to be okay. And instead, they've got to either wait or see that their that request is timed out because. Well, it's the 29th day of the month. They've probably already used their data. Doing things like this, it's behind the scenes. I think mean, no one's ever going to get a promotion for making a page load 30% quicker. Uh, but as part of the public service mission, um, this element of SEO often gets forgotten. But it is truly important when make, to make sure we are reaching people where they are and the context that they're living in. Uh, a, little, a little geek here, but just as important. Uh, there's something called schema code markup from schema.org. Um, see some of you are taking photos, don't worry, all the slides are already attached to uh, this session's page on Drupal GovCon, so you can take the PDF with you. Um, schema, schema markup that's often called schema metadata, it is a way to, uh, in the same way that old school HTML tags, old school metadata, uh, like meta description was able to describe to Google what a page was about, an entire page was about, this is the contact us page. What schema allows us to do is say, this paragraph, this is the mailing address on this contact us page. And this little thing right here, this is the phone number, and this is the TTY number, and this is the organization. So really break down the page into its elements and give Google, give search engines, context, not just content. Um, so using schema powers things like uh, what you see here. So this is, I just searched for National Institutes of Health. This is what comes up. You see a search result, a search box, and Google's version of what a sitemap should look like, what the most popular links are, what they, want, what they think you might be looking for. Schema also powers the right rail of a Google search results. That's called the knowledge graph. So if you've ever uh, searched for your favorite actor or actress and in the right rail, everything they've come up in, here are all their, um, here are all their TV shows and movies and IMDB rankings, all of that. Or tickets from Fandango for the movie they're appearing in next month. All of that is powered by Schema. Uh, it's a little bit of HTML, it's a little bit of extra work for developers, but it pays dividends for folks when they are looking for that quick little hit of information. Um, Google is starting to prioritize that and deliver these sorts of larger search results entries more and more. Uh, they're going to be moving to this sort of model uh, and moving to a similar model where they just give you the single answer instead of a list of results. Um, so introducing schema is going to be really important. Schema is also tied to voice search that I talked about earlier, where you're going to be able to say, for an FAQ page, for example, this thing is an FAQ question. So not only is this the FAQ page, but this is a question, here's its topic, and here's the two paragraph answer to that question. So if someone says, hey Siri, where can I get a pizza? And, uh, 
your page will, your answer will be what theory reads back to the person. So uh, schema is this, has been sort of quietly, at least among uh, non-geeks, has sort of been quietly gathering, gathering steam, has become more and more important. This can help you occupy more real estate on search results pages. Um, and in a world where everyone's time is limited and they just want to click on the first thing they see, having your result take up their entire view screen can't be bad. Finally, we've got to build for accessibility. Uh, there are established best practices for accessibility for both content and code. I've, obviously, that is an entirely separate, huge conversation that could, that could be, and accessibility is its own conference. Uh, for folks inside NIH, making sure you're reviewing your monthly audit reports that used to come out of Accenture, and I think now they're coming out of DK World Space. Uh, so looking at those monthly audit reports, acting on them, resolving your accessibility issues. Agencies have all kinds of checklists and best practices and guides for building accessible sites, building accessible content. I'm not going to go into all those today, obviously. Uh, I do want to just talk about three big ideas that drive those, which is the, the notion of choice. So make sure that you're providing options for audiences and how they can engage with the site, not just forcing them down a single accessibility path. Uh, giving them context. Give more information about what they're reading, watching, or listening so they're confident that they're going to get the content they're expecting. This is just great public service. And a focus on clarity. What they're reading, what they're clicking on, what they're viewing, what they're watching, can they easily understand and follow along? Accessibility, language access, uh, those two things can really come together in, in interesting ways. And finally, it's got to be responsive. Uh, sites need to appear on devices, not the same experience, but an equal experience with equal content across devices. Uh, so even if people experience the site differently, they're experiencing it equally well. I think we, we all tend to get up, get a, sort of focused on making sure that the desktop experience translates pixel perfect exactly down to the tablet experience, and then pixel perfect down to the Samsung or iPhone experience. Those are different contexts. We need to be okay with understanding that we're not going for pixel perfection. We're going for content parity. We're going for interaction parity. Can the person uh, find the same information, explore in the same way, complete the transaction in the same way, download the PDF in the same way, sign up for the newsletter in the same way, uh, regardless of what device they're on? Like I said, uh, more than half the traffic, I think 42% across all of .gov, all government sites, 42% of it is mobile. As of about three weeks ago when I checked on analytics.usa.gov, uh, if you haven't seen analytics.usa.gov, it is really interesting. Um, wait, an analytics site portal is really interesting? It really is. It will tell you where folks are coming from, what they're looking at, how they're using. Um, it gives, gives great insights that can help power everything we're talking about today. Um, this is good for SEO. I mean, again, great public service. I mean, that's, you're, hear, you're hearing me say this again and again today with good reason. Uh, so much of what Google is looking for, what search engines are looking for, is authority and trust. And you do that by building great experiences. You do that by taking the extra time to make sure that everything is responsive. Um, as of mid-March, Google is starting to use what they're called mobile-first indexing. So it's not a separate site of Google that's just for mobile content. But if you have a site that is accessible, it raises in the rankings. If you have, instead of just having a, like a separate m.nih.gov, it just nih.gov is accessible. Everything rises in the rankings. They're using, they're taking mobile first as a serious signal, part, positive signal for authority. You'll notice today that we haven't once talked about keywords. We haven't once talked about keyword research. We haven't once talked about 
paid keyword campaigns or those kind of rankings. All that stuff definitely has a place in SEO. That stuff, I think, we think it comes later. You do these things to establish your authority. On top of that, you can layer on like page-specific tweaks for you know, individual keywords for individual uh, pages. But if you don't do this stuff first, everything else becomes a bad investment. You're not, you're not setting a great foundation on top of uh, what are these other, other pages and other things you can do. Uh, that's because SEO doesn't really start with keyword competition and paid rankings. It means demonstrating expertise, authority, trustworthiness again and again and again, day in and day out. Uh, all of this stuff is great. And for, I'm sure there are lots of content folks here who are just thinking, oh, this all sounds like content strategy and editorial strategy and content development. That's because it is. Uh, and devs in the room are thinking, this sounds a lot like operations and maintenance and monthly support and growth and support and just all the things we've got to do every month. That's because it is. Uh, it's, it's things like this that, you know, as we're thinking about, about SEO, it all boils down in this model to not chasing today's change to not t chasing today's five changes, and instead understanding that SEO isn't this thing we do, it's a thing we get. We do everything else we know we should be doing as great stewards, things we know we should be doing as public servants, things we know we should be doing to fulfill that civic mission. Do that day in, day out. Focus on content strategy, focus on editorial strategy, focus on outreach. Take the time to actually look through those dense reports and fix the broken links. Take the time to actually look through the dense accessibility audit that everyone gets monthly. Uh, you do those things month after month, Google will come to you. You don't need to chase them. We think that really is the way to be successful. I'll open it up for questions. Yes. Question. We just built a site in Drupal 8, mm -hmm. and um, basically what I was told in terms of schema and structured content yeah. was that it's basically built into Drupal 8, or into Drupal. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, how do I know that? <laughs> how do you know that? That's a great question. Uh, so when we, say Drupal, when we say schema is built into Drupal 8, on the content editing, Pages. Uh, obviously, everything's a bunch of form fields. There isn't a form field for putting in schema information. The best way you can test that on a page by page basis, there is a, a tool called the uh, Rich Snippet Testing Tool. So if you just Google the phrase, Google's Rich Snippet Testing Tool. What that does, you, you can get it, the URL for any single page, and it will tell you what schema information is found on that page. There's a related one that's called Open Graph Checker, and Open Graph Checker does a similar thing, but for Twitter and Facebook sharing. So if you want to really see what people are going to see when they share your page on Facebook or Twitter, Open Graph Checker lets you check that. Uh, Rich Schema Testing Tool lets you check schema. So related question, uh, do you have any recommendations in terms of like benchmarking SEO? Do you have questions? Do I have recommendations on benchmarking SEO? The things to look at in terms of like your following strategies. How well is it going to Google? Like, is it the best search? Yeah. Um, or what would you recommend? How optimized your website is for search? Okay. So there are a couple tools. So the question was, are there places to find benchmarks to understand how well your site's doing? Uh, lots of the SEO tools, like Moz.com has SEO Moz. It may just be called Moz at this point. Uh, Ahrefs 
Stat.com is a tool. There's a tool that's called SERP Stat. All of these are really keyword focused. Sorry, SERP Stat. S E R P S T A T. SERP statistics. Search is SERP is search engine result page. So uh, the, that the full frame is search engine result page. That's a Google page. And so people call it SERP stat. Uh, those uh, have both keyword testing. So you can say, for any keyword, where do my where do my URL appear? Uh, Moz also has a site audit, so let's you that shows you. How, how things are doing well, which things are doing well, which things are might, might be having problems on. Uh, SearchStat also has a really good audit tool for those of you. Uh, SearchStat also tracks many of the different Google indexes, so not just the US English desktop index. Uh, it tracks the other international indexes and other language indexes as well. SEMrush has uh, come a long way. And S oh yeah, and SEMrush has come a long way. I haven't honestly looked at SEMrush in a while. Yeah. Um, I think you might have, like the last year has come a long way in doing exactly that. And right. helping you set a benchmark. I think that's actually a really good, really good point, is that we can't think about SEO as something that we'll do today and we'll get it tomorrow. You set a benchmark, figure out where you are, and look at it every month, look at it every quarter and get a sense of how you're, how you're raising and, and lowering. Google is a really conservative organization. I think that's the thing that a lot of people miss. Google is a really conservative organization, and they don't make big changes to the core algorithm likely. Uh, the iPhone came out in 2007. According to Pew Trust, Pew Internet, uh, we passed 50% mobile in 2012. And it wasn't until last March, so four months ago, that Google switched and introduced a mobile first index. So they're a really conservative organization. And that's something we all forget. We want we feel like we've got to chase them because they make all these changes. They're not making big changes on a whim. They they are really following the community. Other questions? Yes. So talking about that right hand real stuff. Yes. So I can look at the right hand rail and say, hey, if we're serving out, so I'm part of the NIH, if mm -hmm. we're serving out disease information, that's great, we're getting it to more people. Yeah. But my executives are looking and saying, if we get stuff in the right hand rail, that's less traffic to our site. Yes. So is Google <laughs> no, offering any incentives or ways to count or tell them? what's going on with the right hand rail. Because basically, we're offering information that they're selling. Right. And and, yeah. and we're not getting anything for it or even finding, having a way to tell how many people are seeing it. Yeah. So I was just, <laughs> uh, and or is this something they've even talked about or thought about? Uh, they have talked about it and explicitly said they don't get out of information. <laughs> I know that's not the answer you want to hear, but that's, yeah, they are really candy about how to, aside from saying, do what you, gotta, do what you need to do, and use schema, they are really candy about exactly what you need to do to get your content to a your snippets to appear either at the top or on that right rail. They don't give out appearance or usage information at all. Now, a lot of folks have the same concern you have uh, that that right now is taking away page views, which I don't want to get too far to justify what we do. Well, in a way, and I don't want to get too far afield, but this is a great opportunity to develop a new analytics model to think about what are your organizational goals, what are the strategies you're doing online to meet those goals, what are the KPIs and analytics you want to gather. You can so you tie those you create KPIs, you create goals with Google Analytics that are tied to your organization goals. Those aren't going to be page views. Those might be PDF downloads, email, time on site, scroll depth, etc. Those aren't going to be page views. They're not going to be balance rate. Okay, how does having a page view move the admission forward? Right. So uh, that's a whole different talk <laughs> on uh, what's called the 
analytics measurement model. Uh, a fellow, uh, there's a stock called Occam's Razor, run by uh, Avinash Kashik, who used to be Google Analytics evangelist, now runs Market Motive, uh, Chicago. He wrote a, a great blog piece 10 years ago now called the Analytics Measurement Model, which talks about exactly that, how you move away from page views. Uh, and all those vanity metrics, those reach metrics, and really tied with your metrics, tied your metrics to your organization. Any other questions? Yes. Or I think it's really bad for Uh, I frame is really bad for mapping. Yeah. Um, Google is smart enough now to know that that content is coming from the iframe, so it can read the iframe, but you're not getting any credit for it. The, the iframe source itself, that domain is going to get credit for that content. Is that the same for embedding? Um, depending on how you're embedding, like if you embed, embed a tweet, um, your, this gets kind of technical, uh, let's say there's one point of, uh, of length to give, you get half of that point, and the thing you embed get half, gets half of that point. Okay, but how about if you post really good content on uh, a medium.com or exposure or something like that, and then embed it into your site? So if you post really good content on medium.com, but then embed it into your site, right? That is deep Google food. Let me think about that one <laughs> um, Depending on how you embed, I think that your domain is going to get most of the, I'll say page rank, even though that uh, thing didn't exist anymore. Um, you're gonna, your site is going to get most of the domain authority for that embed, if it's your own. Right. And if on Medium, you have included some authorship information. The schema authorship. Yeah, so that's another place where schema is important for establishing authorship, even on content that exists in your tertiary domains or out in the world. Uh, but I think Anil Dash has been writing a lot recently about Medium and uh, how it's being used, and he has some very strong opinions about the value of Medium uh, for content owners and for publishers. Spoiler, you can't say it. Other questions? In the back. Yes, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, thank you. So thinking about the storefront, the storefront certification, yes. is there a way to track or tag somehow so that we can keep track of, of traffic to those third-party sites without asking the third parties? Or, or um, And does that help with your domain authority, or does it help the third-party site for their domain? Uh, it helps both. So, well, the content that they, that they take from HHS storefront and embed in your site, uh, it used to be that they got all the authority. I think that the team that owns the HHS storefront is changing what gets sent over in the, in the embed and the, in the uh, JSON file behind it so that you get some of the authority. HHS storefront, their analytics are getting better constantly. So you can go into your accountant on the HHS storefront and see who is syndicating your content, exactly which content is being syndicated, how many times, and how many page views it's getting. So it doesn't come from Google, but it comes, it's going to come through a storefront. So if you're using something like Tableau or another one of those uh, analytics aggregator dashboards, uh, Google Data Studio, you can pull that all together for your uh, for your senior executives. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, maybe you speak about that. Okay. The point about when you say right to have some paychecks, or is that encourage to take it from Google? What do you mean right to click through? I mean, they can. Yeah, so click through. Um, let's say every search results page, you may have individual results. Right. You want yours to be first. Okay. Uh, but writing a page title that encourages someone to read it and say, oh, that's, that looks interesting. Oh, I see. Right, so and informative. Right, like I want to put through from Google back to your, back uh, to your side. Okay. Um, you 
be a lot of folks that have really great rankings, but no one wants to click through because it, the, you know, the excerpt isn't interesting. Like a contact us page, it doesn't say contact us for latest information, reach our media department, etc. The snippet will be the phone number or half of the phone number and half of it. So just really good descriptive titles. Just good, really descriptive titles that are both descriptive and engaging. That's what your copywriters are going to be great for. Can I ask you a second part of the question? Yes, sir. Um, on the issue of relevance ranking. Relevance ranking. Yeah, yes. So like I run the website and people are just putting the same keywords like, you know, wetlands four times to get a higher ranking. And that doesn't really help. So um, it's so you're asking about putting yeah. keywords inside meta keywords, right. HTML, mm -hmm. to try and raise ranking? Right. Uh, it used to be that that actually hurt you because people thought you were keyword spamming and that would actually lower your, your, your ranks. As about six months to a year ago, depending on who you ask, they just ignored that entirely. They ignored meta keywords entirely. No positive signal, it's no negative signal. It's not even there anymore. Thank you. Question, yes sir. Uh, there's a bunch of tools in Google search. I don't know, like these rich, like structured content, rich bars and things like that. Yeah. Have you looked at that? Is that useful? Is there value there? Uh, can you ask that question again? I have some, some noise coming in. Uh, there's in the Google Search Console. In Google Search Console. There's a bunch of tools in there around. You know, kind of, it seems like you can train the structure of your content, rich bars, like things like that. Mm -hmm. Is there value there? I mean, I've kind of looked at it. I've never really dove into that. Is that useful? Is that a useful thing to try to help optimize something? user experience in terms of the search results. It is. So the question was, inside Google Search Console, which if you haven't, if you are using Google Search Console to capture and own your domain, you should. They give great insights to what's happening. Uh, to which pages your, to which pages that you own, Google has captured in the index. Uh, and you'll be surprised. I have a client that has 5,000 pages on their site. 200 of them were in the index. Um, well, why do you do? So but the question was, inside Google Search Console, there are some tools to help you understand which snippets, to help you preview and troubleshoot uh, what may show up on that live rail. Is it a useful tool? Uh, yes, it is a useful tool. I believe that they are currently rolling out a redesign of the Google Search Console. It's in beta and available for some people. I think that Unfortunately, that tool may be either going away or being hidden in that redesign because uh, nothing good gets to last. <laughs> uh, so I would, if you really, if you use that tool, bookmark that URL because I'm sure the page will exist. If it's Google, the page will continue to exist. The URL will continue to exist, and they're just going to hide out of the UI. So bookmark that URL. Other questions. Yeah, when we were talking about items that are in the uh, right rail yes. and traffic to those, why couldn't you use Crazy Egg to track um, the traffic to those individual locations? So the question is, yeah. in search, on the search results page of the right rail, why can't you use Crazy Egg to track how okay. that can Yeah, that was, how many clicks are going there? Um, because that page is a Google.com page, and you likely don't have access to install Crazy Egg on Google.com. <laughs> 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 when you set up a web page, it's oh. you have the right rail. Okay. Yeah. And it tracks okay. tracking traffic to the items in the right rail. You can do that if it's your own domain. You right. can, you can, that should be out of the box with Google Analytics or Google Tag Manager these days. Okay. Um, and you should be able to set up crazy I can see heat map and you see who's looking at it. Google Tag Manager, if it's Google Tag Manager should tell you if it's if that's your if it's your own content in the right rail, you'll see that in the Google Analytics results, uh, inside content drill down. If it's an off if you're linking off site, you'll see that as in the exit page report of Google Analytics, you'll see 
to do the look at that right now and click off site. But it won't tell you which specific location that they you clicked can. off. Yeah, you, you can actually, if you, uh, this is getting really deep in the link building, but if you configure your link in the right way, uh, using, I think it's called um, Google L, so you, you add REL equals right, like right, right column, um, that sets up a different link in Google Analytics. I know we're getting outside of SEO, but they're all related. Um, that sets up a different URL inside Google Analytics. You can actually track not only where the click is coming from, but actually what position on the page. Uh, also really good for email marketing to do the same thing inside your the email blast you're sending out. Each link gets its own second part of the Any other questions? Thank you so much for your time today. It was a true pleasure. Uh, this is this PDF is now on the uh, page for this talk. Um, there are some resources. If you have questions for me, if you just want to hang out, I'm going to be at the phase two table for the next little bit. Thanks so much for your time today, everyone. Thank you.